Okay, now this thing's been sitting on my shelf for far too long. This is the French daily combat ration menu number two. So anyway, let's get out in the forest and give this a field test. Okay, so I'm out in the woods today, field testing this. This is the menu number two, French reheatable individual 24 hour ration pack. Now, I'll be up front with you. We're gonna cheat a little bit today because firstly, there's actually quite a lot of food in here probably more than I need on a short day like this. When I say a short day, I'm out for the whole of daylight hours in the woods here, but it's a short day. It's the middle of October. The days are shortening now. There's actually not an awful lot of need for me to eat three hearty meals during those daylight hours. So what I thought might be interesting is to try to make this last for two days. So today, actually, what we're going to do is eat half of the stuff in here and try and spin it out with some foraged ingredients. Let's go walking off down that way. We'll see if we can find somewhere to have breakfast. So the first and probably most obvious thing we can forage, if we can avoid these curious cows, is mushrooms. And I can see down here, I don't know if you can see those on the camera, We've got yellow chanterelles, so I'm going to pick a few of those and we'll save them for later. Excuse me, ladies. And there's quite a lot of chanterelles in this area here. I can see more over there. Good cows are heading off now. <laughs> I'm uh, not likely to be bothered by them more than they are bothered by me, to be honest. Now, there's a lot of these here, so we can afford to be a little bit picky. I'm not looking to fill my basket today, just looking to have a little taste of the wild. Okay, so here's a fantastic food resource right here, crab apples. These are wild apples, and they don't look like much, but at this time of year, they hopefully should have sweetened a little bit, and those that are remaining on the tree should be free of insects. Now I could just pick them up off the ground here, there's some on the ground, but I'd have to wash them. So I'm going to pick a few off the tree and we're going to see what meals we can add those into. There's also this, this is white beam and it's a relative of rowan, mountain ash, and usually it's dropped its berries by now, but this particular tree seems to be hanging on to them. These berries are edible, I've only ever cooked them before, but uh, you know, it's a rose family berry. There's another crab apple tree there. Let's have a little taste of what these are like raw. Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're not bitter. They're not sour. They don't have an awful lot of flavor. However, there'll be some food value in there. So if we had to, we could add those to our porridge or something like that, gain a little bit more energy from eating these berries. Just in case anybody thinks I'm eating holly berries, there is a holly tree here with berries on it, which are poisonous. This tree here, however, is white beam, and I can tell that because, well, the leaves on the ground, these are white beam leaves, the pale buff colored ones you can see there, and there are still a few leaves hanging on the tree. That aids with identification. I know that that's white beam because the underside of the leaf is sort of felty and, well, white when it's growing. I'm not going to pick these berries today because I've got better things to add to my food. So this looks like quite a nice place to stop and get some breakfast. I'm just going to sit on this log here and see what we're going to have for breakfast. Just stumbled across this rather superb little clump of seps here. Most of them are a little bit over for picking, and I've never seen them growing directly in swampy ground, so, so wet as this before. Like I say, well, some of those are still pickable. I'm not going to overdo it today. I might pick that one down there, because we will add that to a meal later on. I might have a little scout just up here, just to see if there's anything nicer or sounder that we can pick. Yeah, there's more there. Those are not seps, that's something different. Gosh, there's a whole load of them up there. I'm just going to 
scoot up there and have a look. Would you look at that? I've truly never seen anything like this before. I've never seen such a local abundance of penny buns, that is, seps or porcini mushrooms. Just a shame that so many of them have seemed to have been kicked over. But I can only imagine that must have been by deer on their way through here. But yeah, just so many, so many Lovely seps everywhere. Here's a particularly good one. You can you can tell when they're good because you can kind of tap them and they almost ring like a bell. But I have no particular use for this many mushrooms today, so I'm gonna leave them. Even though part of me wants to fill my basket with these mushrooms, I don't have a use for them and in all honesty they would probably spoil before I get to dry them or anything like that because I'm not planning to go home until after dark today so just gotta put aside that kind of greed to grab what's here and just marvel at the spectacle of this many mushrooms all in the same place they must have just been waiting here to spring up until the rain came. And then the rain's come down and filled up these channels. There's even more over there. It's amazing. The rain has just filled up these channels and all of these mushrooms must have just been so ready to fruit. Quite incredible. What a spectacle. So I've just picked one nice sound set. I think it must be deer that's knocked these over because humans would have picked them. But further on up there, I can just see more and more and more of them. Now, so people have on occasion described what I do as whimsy foraging or recreational foraging. And they're kind of not wrong in the sense that I'm not doing this to survive. I'm not doing this to avoid buying food in the supermarket. I'm just doing this to supplement my diet with some interesting things and to gain a better appreciation of nature. Now, if I wanted to, I could go and go grab a bigger basket and pick, there must be hundreds of mushrooms here. I could pick a carload of mushrooms, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want all these mushrooms. And what would I do with them? I could preserve them, but it just seems greedy. I would rather leave them here. Maybe some other people will come and pick them. Maybe they will just get to spread their spores and we'll have more mushrooms next year, all the more for it. So my breakfast this morning is just going to be a cup of coffee and that muesli, plus some foraged things. Most of the things in this ration pack are the same as the menu number nine that I tested. So only really the main course and the canned items are very different in this ration pack. So that's why I'm mixing it up a little bit today. I'm gonna to hopefully add some forage things, make this into a more interesting uh, experience, but also I'm gonna spin this out over two days. So my muesli, I'm gonna add some crab apples into it. Now I did already admit I'm cheating a little bit today. So in addition to all the other ways of cheating, I've actually brought hot water with me. I will be cooking over this little stove, but I kind of figured that we're not actually testing the survivability of people out in the forest here. We're just testing the edibility and the palatability of these contents. 
of the ration pack. So, for the muesli, I thought we might actually make this into like a hot porridge. So normally you're meant to put cold water in there and turn that into muesli, but today I'm going to make a warm porridge out of it because it's October and although it's quite mild out here in the woods, certainly if you were trying to use this ration pack to keep yourself fed and warm, you'd probably look for every little bit of warmth you could. Just going to give that a bit of a stir up and then let that hot water soak into the oats and everything else that's in there. Meanwhile, oh, I can smell a really nice red berry aroma coming off of that, but we're going to try to, every meal we look at today, we're going to try to add a little bit of forage something or other to it. So these are the crab apples that I picked earlier. And yeah, I mean, they're not massive. They're not great. Let's have a little taste of that on its own. Wow. Super sour. Wow. That is so astringent. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut this up into very tiny little pieces and drop it into my porridge and stir it through. And it's just hopefully that, that sourness and astringency is going to give it a little bit of a zing. I think probably if you wanted to eat quantity of these, you're going to have to roast them or something like that to try to sweeten them a little bit and drive off some of that bitterness. That surprised me with how sour that really was. I've eaten crab apples before. Perhaps we'll try a different one actually because I picked these off of several different trees. So some of them look a little bit more ripe than others. So let's have a look at this one here. So this one looks a little bit more possibly ripe. It's yellower than the other one. Wow. <laughs> that is <laughs> kind of sour that goes beyond rhubarb. Anyway, there we go. I've got a little bit of foraged apple in my porridge there, and I'm going to stir that right in because then the sweetness of that porridge can hopefully balance that a little bit. So let's give this a try. I've never eaten this warm before, but let's see what it's like. I'm going to get a piece of apple in there as well so that we can see what that, that mixture is like. There we go. There's a bit with some apple. Yeah, so mixed in like that, and probably mixed into other things. So if we made something with those white bean berries and crab apples, I reckon we could probably balance it. Mm. That's really nice as a porridge, as a hot porridge. Actually, a little bit too sweet that way. So I may put some more of it, more of those bits of apple in there. Now the other thing to say is that if we're spinning this out over two days, we're going to run out of hot beverages in the kit. So we're going to have to improvise some hot beverages. Now there are a bunch of different things we can do there. We could actually chop up some of these crab apples and put them into hot water, and that would hopefully make a refreshing tea. There are gorse flowers up there on the heath that we can go and pick. We can have pine needles. Uh, we can make tea out of pine needles. So there's a bunch of different things we can do to spin out these beverages or to improvise our own beverages over a two-day period. Anyway, I'm going to finish my breakfast now, and then we'll go for a wander and see what else we can see. So I've brought enough fresh water for my drinking needs today and for my cooking needs. Obviously, if I was spinning this out over two days... Oh, wow, look, another great big set there. How about that? Just everywhere. We've had such a dry summer, and then suddenly we've had weeks and weeks of rain. All the mushrooms have really sprung up, all at once, everywhere. Anyway, as I was saying, the water, there is fresh water here. Obviously, if I was going to drink that, I would need those water purification tablets. That brown colour is not dirt, it's just uh, 
tannin out of leaves and out of the peat, the upland peat, where this water is draining from. But you saw those cows earlier, didn't you? So um, all of that also runs off into this water. So this would need to be boiled or purified with those water purification tablets. We don't need to do that though today because we are only doing this for one day. Okay, we've got here, hopefully, a fantastic wild food resource. Assuming we can find some where we've got to them before the squirrels did. These are sweet chestnuts. And we're going to find that most of them have been opened and pilfered by the squ squirrels already. In fact, look, look, you can see where they've eaten them. But that's okay. You know, that's what these are. That's what the squirrels do. And fair play to them. Yeah, that's a bit squashy, that one. But if we hunt around, hopefully we'll find some chestnuts that have fallen just recently and the squirrels haven't had a chance to open yet. Now, that could be one here. So, these are incredibly spiny. So I don't want to get my fingers anywhere near those spines because it will just hurt me. Not much in them. Yeah, a little bit dry actually, but that one might be all right. We're going to keep on looking around anyway. I'll gather up a few of the, few of these chestnuts and hopefully we can do something with them. Well, they haven't left me much. Most of these shells have been picked clean and most of what's left here is the little small, the small infertile chestnuts. However, yeah, if you hunt around, there are one or two to be had. So that's a magnificent sweet chestnut and we will add that to one of our meals later. Okay, here's another fungus that we are very familiar with. This is hedgehog fungus. And we appear to be standing in a very broad ring of them that spreads all the way across there and probably comes back that way somewhere. So definitely gonna pick some of these because I am very familiar with them and I know that they're a good edible fungus. So we'll get a few of these. Lovely edible fungus, this one. Instead of gills underneath, it has these little spines and that's why it's called hedgehog fungus. Always important to make sure before we put these in the basket that we scrape as much as we can of the forest leaf litter off of them and they'll be much more easy to prepare later on. I'm not, not going to take too many. Just across this little brook here and we can see deer tracks in the mud there, including some quite large ones. Look at that. That's obviously the footprint of quite a large stag, I would say. And I can still hear them over there. So yeah, if we were... If this was a true survival situation, then obviously hunting down one of those would be a massive bonus, but I'm not going to do that because I'm not allowed for one thing. But also, there's plenty of other things I can eat around here to keep me going. Okay, so lunchtime. And let's have a think about what we're going to have for lunch. So we've managed to forage three different species of mushrooms. We'll talk a little bit about foraging mushrooms in a minute because it's not necessarily the best idea if you're actually foraging to survive. But we'll talk about that a little bit more while we're cooking lunch. I am actually gonna cook mushrooms for lunch having said that. So, I think what we'll do today for lunch, well, I've got this chicken soup and I think I'm gonna turn it into chicken and wild mushroom soup. So, Now, like I say, I, have, I am cheating a little bit today. I've got my little gas stove and I've got my billy cans. So, yeah, we're not completely dependent on the ration pack, as it were. If you're foraging for survival out in the woods, mushrooms aren't necessarily the best choice because, well, for one thing, if you don't know what you're picking, there's a strong possibility that you'll pick something poisonous, or at least a, it's a big enough risk to avoid it. The other thing is that mushrooms aren't tremendously nutritious. I'll tell you what I mean by that. So, mushrooms are 
when I say nutritious, they are quite high in protein in terms of dry weight, but they really are just mostly water. And so, in terms of food value, the amount of food that you'll get from foraging a basket of mushrooms is probably less than the effort you spent into gathering it. And so, their utility as a wild food is not so high. Um, you're better off always with nuts, berries, fruits and animal sources of nutrition if you can get them. However, what mushrooms are good at is transforming a dull dish into an interesting one. If you like the flavour of mushrooms, that is. So that's what I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to take that chicken soup, which is, I'm sure, just a perfectly adequate instant chicken soup, and I'm going to turn it into a chicken and wild mushroom soup. I'm putting quite a lot of mushrooms in here. Now the other thing as well is that these mushrooms are lovely and they're perfectly intact and free of bugs and everything else like that. So really happy with these seps. They're magnificent specimens. They must have popped up really quickly and grown up before the flies could get to them. Again, if you were, if you were foraging to survive, now eating mushrooms that have got maggots in them might actually be better for you than eating mushrooms without because those maggots have got quite a fair bit of food value as well as vitamins that you need and a bit more protein. So it might seem like a horrible idea eating insects, but actually if you're surviving, you'll get more. This is, I commented, there was an interesting video by Good and Basic, which I'll link in the video description in a moment, because he was deliberating whether to eat a wild mushroom he'd found. And in the end, he decided not to. My advice was, well, if you're doing that to survive, the best thing to do is roll over that log that you found that mushroom growing on and look for insects underneath and eat the insects because insects are a much greater source of nutrition and food value than mushrooms are. And of course, significantly less risky as well. So, quite a lot of mushrooms there, but they do cook down. But I'm gonna put a bit of everything in here because I've picked three different species. I've picked white, yellow chanterelles, hedgehog mushrooms and seps today. So I might as well enjoy the fruits of my labor. That'll do for now, I think. That's probably quite a lot of mushrooms, but they will cook, as I say, they will cook down. Let's do all the chanterelles because I do like them. I'm not washing these or anything. They are pretty clean. I've made sure that I picked them quite clean. Yeah, that'll do. So, I mentioned we're cheating, right? So we've got the little gas stove. Superb little folding gas stove, this one. Gets really nice and hot very quickly and cools down quickly too for packing away. Tripod base that just folds out. It's just spot on for this kind of cooking out in the wild. I'm just going to wedge that into the crevices in the bark there. Good. Now, because as I mentioned, we're cheating today, I did actually bring a little bottle of oil with me so I can fry these mushrooms up. I knew we'd find mushrooms today. And so I've got a little bit of olive oil there that we can use to stop those sticking to the pan. So, let's get the stove going and get those frying up. Now, once they start to cook, they will shrivel right down, all the water will come out of them, and then they'll fry again. I'm just going to add some of the black pepper from the ration pack. I'm not adding salt because there's probably quite a bit of salt in that chicken soup mix. Now, I haven't added any liquid at all to that, and what we've got there is actually almost a mushroom soup on its own. 
all of that liquid has come out of those mushrooms especially as the weather's been quite damp lately the mushrooms have got a higher moisture content than they might otherwise do normally okay those mushrooms are cooked through now and i'm gonna be careful i don't over fry them because this is not a non-stick pan they'll have a tendency just to stick to this aluminium mess tin so we're going to add that chicken soup mix which is yep it's just a well wow, interesting quite a it smells I, mean, I think it might have a little bit of seafood stock in it but we're just going to add that in there anyway like that we're going to add a good glug of water before that starts to burn and then we're going to bring that up to the boil let's just stir that in while that starts to it's gone a bit lumpy but that's fine well, it's not quite the chicken soup that I thought it was going to be. I thought that was going to be like a cream of chicken soup, but it looks more like it's a, a kind of, um, almost like a lobster bisque. In fact, it did say on the packet that there may be, that there's crustaceans in it, so it might have a little bit of fish stock in there. Anyway, we're going to turn that up a little bit, let that come to the boil. And I'm going to thicken it with some of these biscuits. So we've got to be careful because some of these are sweet and I don't want to put the sweet ones in it. So just a packet of these plain crackers. Just going to taste a little bit. Mm, they're just slightly salty plain crackers. I'm going to break those up into pieces. Not like croutons because I actually want them to dissolve in and thicken this soup a little bit because we, what we're trying to do here is spin this ration out so that it will last for two days. I am surrounded by deer. If they come too close and they start looking like they're gonna knock anything over, I will just make some loud noises and I'm sure they'll retreat. And now we're just going to let that come to the boil, simmer it for a little bit, soften those those biscuits, and then that's lunch. That's bubbling really nicely now, and it's thickened up. Those crackers have kind of dissolved in, and given that a really lovely hearty texture. Let's have a little taste, just of the soup itself. Mm, that's good. So, chicken and wild mushroom soup, bon appetit. Mmm, really good. And that's a nice hearty meal that we've made from one of the minor ingredients in this ration pack. Okay, now one of the things I want to do is just test out this little heater. So this little stove, we'll use this to cook our beverage. Honestly, that little spork, we'll try eating something with that later, but it's just worthless. Um, matches, fuel tablets, and this little stove. Now, last time I tried one of these, I didn't assemble it correctly. There is a right way to do this, and it's to fold all four of these tabs upwards. That little tray there holds the uh, fuel tablet. So we fold up the edges, and then we fold those edges in as well. And that provides a little bit of a windshield. And as you can see, these little bits here have folded down to form feet. So I'm hoping we can find a way to balance this on the tree and that my cup will sit on top of there and I'm going to try to heat up my water for my beverage in that little heater. Now, these fuel tablets, last time I tried this I had a lot of trouble getting them to light, but let's have a go. 
I think it's good that they give you toothpicks in here. That's useful because some of these foods have got bits that will get stuck in your teeth. So, lovely box of matches with a picture of the Eiffel Tower on it and the Arc de Triomphe. This is, after all, a French ration pack. The matches strike well. Ah, it's gone out. This is where we're gonna... This is where I had trouble last time, trying to light these tablets. Now, it could be that that's the way to do it, is to place the match on top. Let's see if I can relight that one and get a Another go with that one as well. These little airs bit tablets, once they get going, which I think may just have happened in that corner, yes, I can see that the corner of that tablet has now lit. Good. Okay. So I'm going to try boiling water for my beverage over this little stove. I've got a tin cup so I can boil it straight in the cup and I'm only going to go for half a cup of water. Carefully balance that on there. It is incredibly precarious but let's see how we get on. It's still burning so that's good. So I'm going to make my tea here, my Lipton yellow label tea. But I think I'm going to try a little bit of crab apple in there, just to give it a bit of a zing. It'll be like lemon tea, hopefully, because this stuff is definitely as astringent as lemons. So let's, I'm actually just going to peel that crab apple so that we get rid of those nasty bits of dirt on the peel. Still burning down there, that's good. Uh, I can see smoke rising. I think that's just where the fuel tablets have started to break those matches. Well, I might be able to see steam rising there. Maybe that's boiling already. Right, so just going to chop in a few little pieces of crab apple into that water just to infuse. And it might seem that all these things I'm doing today are a bit silly. I've got a ration pack, I've got food. I don't actually need to do all of these things where I'm assembling bits and pieces from nature. But psychology is an important part of staying alive. And in a situation where you've got, where you're maybe cut off from other people, keeping yourself happy by doing little things is an important part of staying alive. Okay, now, important thing to do is to pack away the matches in the waterproof bag before they get damp. Okay, well we've got some little bubbles rising in this water now. So actually, <coughs> it seems like, yeah, one of these little tablets will probably boil, I would have think, probably a, a full cup full of water there. I'm going to leave it a little bit longer because it's not quite boiling yet. Okay, so that water's bubbling away now, and pretty much as hot as it's going to get, I think. So, tea bag in. Now, normally I would not put a tea bag in while the water is still boiling, but from experience, these Lipton Yellow Label tea bags are a little bit weedy, and so I think it's going to need to be in there a little while. That's the Lipton Yellow Label tea with a little bit of crab apple in there just to sharpen it up a bit. Now if you can hear crashing noises behind me, I'm pretty sure that's stags battling each other, clashing their antlers. It's happening just over there, just over the brow of this hill, and it's so tempting to go over there and have a look, but I really don't want to disturb them. While the drama of rutting stags plays out over there, let's just taste 
this Lipton yellow label tea with crab apple. Mm, it's a bit like lemon tea, so those crab apples have worked really well in that drink and they've just provided a nice little acidic note, note much better than when I tried them raw. So I'm actually going to taste one of these little pieces of crab apple now that they're cooked. They've been boiled in tea. Mm. Still really zingy. About the same acidity as a lemon, I would say. And unfortunately not as nutritious as a lemon, so the acid in there is malic acid, not vitamin C. But yeah, interesting little flavour. Hmm. Now I don't want to be too frugal with the rations here, so I'm going to have the commando bar. This is a coffee flavoured kind of energy protein snack bar. Oh, you need good teeth for that. It's alright. It tastes quite strongly of coffee, but it tastes like kind of artificial instant coffee. It's extremely hard. Quite sweet when you chew it up. I suppose that's going to give me some energy. So I'll finish up my tea, and then we'll go for a little wander and see if we can find anything else interesting to look at. Okay, now if this is what I think it is, it's a highly prized edible fungus. Let's have a look. Yeah, so this is a fungus called the saffron milk cap. And when damaged, it produces this, well, saffron colored milk from the tissues. This specimen, I think, is a bit bug-eaten, so it's probably not for me. But we can see, oh gosh, yes, it's riddled with maggots, unfortunately. So we won't be eating that one. But it produces, especially from the gills, this saffron-coloured juice. So it's the saffron milk cap. And, or carrot-coloured, I would say, probably, that is. And, yep, highly prized edible fungus, but... Uh, yeah, bugs got there first on that one, so we won't be eating that. Now, if I may, I'd like to say a few words about this fungus. This is Amanita muscaria, fly agaric is its common name, and I've mentioned in a couple of videos in passing that I don't pick this because it's poisonous. And some people took issue with my statement about this being a poisonous mushroom. Well, and apparently there's some big conspiracy where uh, people are trying to stop you eating this because it's got psychoactive properties. Well, I'm not going to deny this mushroom has psychoactive properties. It contains two chemicals called ibotenic acid and muscimol, and those things are hallucinogenic, and people eat these recreationally and have done for centuries. However, this mushroom also may contain an unknown amount of muscarine. Muscarine is a toxic chemical, and so whilst Yes, people eat this mushroom recreationally, and most of them experience no more severe symptoms than vomiting or sweating, nausea, giddiness, loss of balance. Not that any of those things sound like great fun to me, but as I say, the amount of muscarine you will find in these mushrooms is wildly variable, and so it's quite possible to get badly poisoned by these mushrooms. So I maintain my position that this is a poisonous mushroom. It's not deadly poisonous in most cases, and yes, people eat it after boiling it in water, and then that removes the toxic chemicals and it can be safely eaten. Apparently it's really delicious. We may try that one time. But I'm not backing down from the position that this is a poisonous mushroom. When I say poisonous, I don't mean deadly. I just mean that I choose not to eat it because it's got potentially harmful effects on the human body. So yeah, if you want to eat this mushroom recreationally and you want to take that risk, well, you're your own person. I'm not your I'm not your real mum. So, 
you go ahead and do whatever seems right to you. But I will say, don't call me a liar for saying this was a poisonous mushroom. Okay, so here's something we've got that we could use to expand the range of beverages available to us. This is bilberry, so our native blueberry, which doesn't often fruit especially well here in the new forest, but the foliage, I mean, it's grazed down a little bit too much to fruit well here, but the foliage can be used to make a tea. So we could pick these leaves and brew up a tea from them. And it's okay, it tastes like green tea. Okay, so I've been wandering about a little bit. I'm feeling a bit dehydrated, so it's important to stay hydrated. So I'm gonna have a little break and a drink. So really, if we were trying to conserve energy here, what I would have done is made camp, left my pack there and all my heavy stuff and if I was going out foraging or whatever, I'd just take only what I need, so I'm not carrying too much weight. Obviously, I haven't been doing that today because I'm just going on a bit of a walkabout. So, I've got a heavy pack. I've lost a fair bit of fluids, and I'm feeling a little bit jittery in need of some blood sugar. So I'm going to eat the nougat with fruits now. What I'm trying to do here as well is some of these items in this pack are more versatile than others. The nougat can, well, we could do something with it, but mostly that's just a piece of energy. So, gonna eat that now. Gonna save things like the fruit jelly, well, fruit paste, if we can, because that I can chop up and put in with some crackers and make a kind of porridge type of thing, a little fruity porridge. It's the same nougat we had before in menu number nine. It's a very sweet, fruity nougat with rice paper on the outside. It's very tasty, mostly sugar, but that's what I need right now. So this fungus, I believe, is porcelain fungus, but I don't know it well enough to be sure enough to eat it but it's growing all the way up this dead branch of this beech tree. In fact, I probably shouldn't stand here because this will fall on me. But if this is what I think it is, it is an edible fungus. It's kind of slimy on top. Not in the best of condition, actually, these specimens, although the ones up there are, but they're gonna have to stay up there. But we don't eat things that we haven't identified. So I'm just gonna look at them, enjoy, and leave them be. Right, well, here's a nice spot just by the river's edge to have dinner. I'm getting hungry. I've actually burnt probably quite a lot of calories just wandering about the woods today. And I have been eating fairly minimally, so I'm ready for this. So I had planned to have the salmon with vegetables today, but given that I've got mushrooms and chestnuts here, I actually think the couscous with chicken will go better with that. So I'm gonna have the couscous with chicken as my main meal, and we're gonna mix it up with mushrooms, and I'm gonna cook those chestnuts somehow. But first, I think I need a little snack just to keep me going. So I'm gonna have a couple of squares of the dark chocolate, just to keep me going while I cook. Okay, and so it's just a dark chocolate bar, a little bit of bloom on there. Very hard dark chocolate. Got some amazing chestnuts that I can add to my dinner. That one's really superb. And I've got a few wild mushrooms left as well. So I think what we're gonna do, I think we're gonna go for a stew type thing again because to spin this out and pad it out into a full size meal, we've really gotta go for the stews and the, the mixtures. So, first thing I'm going to do is get a brew going. Okay, so that water's up to temperature. I'm just going to stop the stove. And we're going to go for another cup of coffee here. And I don't normally have sugar in my coffee, but 
I'm feeling like I need the energy today, so one of those five gram sachets of sugar is going to go in that coffee. Probably made that a bit weak, but that won't be a bad thing because I need the hydration. Absent from this ration pack is any kind of milk or dairy creamer or even non-dairy creamer. It's just black coffee and black tea is what you're going to get. So, if that's cool enough to touch, which it almost is, I'm going to leave that there to cool down. Just over there. And I've just got an idea here. I'm going to try roasting the chestnut over the flame. Now I'm going to make sure I prick it with the fork because these things can explode. And then, carefully, Deposit that chestnut on there and see what's let's see what happens. Okay, well I guess I'm gonna stop there because otherwise I'm just gonna burn this thing and that'll be a shame to waste food. I'm gonna let that cool down for a little bit and see what's happened to it when it's cooked. So again, tiny bit of olive oil. I am cheating, I know it don't need to tell me. And this time I'm only going to use the hedgehog mushrooms. The seps are a bit mushy really, to be honest, to be cooked fresh. They've got a good flavour, but they're not great in terms of texture. So I'm just going to break up these hedgehog mushrooms, make sure I get all of the little bits of dirt and forest debris off the caps. and underneath the caps, and then break those up into the pan. They break up quite easily. Now what would be great here would be some wild garlic, but it's really the wrong time of year for that, unless I want to dig for it. And the danger with digging for wild garlic at this time of year is I might end up digging up wild daffodils or something like that, and that would not be so delicious, because it would kill me. Right, so. those mushrooms simmering, or sizzling rather. And let's see if this chestnut is cool enough to touch yet. Okay, I don't want to do this right over the pan, so I'm going to do it here. Well, that's worked. That's definitely roasted that chestnut a little bit too much, if anything. I'm having to waste some of it, peeling off the, the burnt skin. It's a little bit too done. But there we go, so that's actually a cooked chestnut. That's cooked ever so quickly. Okay, I'm gonna set that aside because that's going in my dinner. Well, in fact, I'm going to put it in there with the mushrooms. So I'm just going to chop that up. And it's just going to be like potato, really, in this dish, because chestnuts are a lot like potato in flavor and in texture and in the way they cook as well. They're starchy nuts. Here's what they look like raw. Be a bit careful, I don't cut my fingers here. But these are fantastic chestnuts. They're really, really sound and fresh. And fortunately, free of bugs. That's a that's a superb chestnut. I'm just going to scrape that outer pith off there because that can be a little bit astringent. Although it's usually okay once it's cooked. But that astringent pith there, you could use that for stopping bleeding if you need to. It's very, very astringent and quite useful as a styptic if you need it. So that stuff there, you could put that on a small wound and that would stop it bleeding. But we don't need to do that today. So I'm just going to chop these. You can see how different that texture of the uncooked chestnut is, but it's going to go in there anyway. And 
I'll just give that a little simmer alongside it. I'm going to just put one more in, I think. Okay, so we've got three chestnuts and three hedgehog fungus just frying up in there. And we've got two chestnuts left. Now, those will be part of part two, or they would be. So when we get home tonight, I'm, I'll tell you what we could notionally do with part two. I don't know how much of that I'm actually going to follow through and do because I haven't got any more time off. But those could be made into a porridge tomorrow morning. We could smash those up with some crackers and a few other bits and pieces and make a nutty porridge. Well, that smells really good. Chestnuts and hedgehog fungus. We're going to have to remember that. That could be a recipe that we'll use at home sometime in the future. Okay, now those have cooked down. So now we're just going to put some water in here to make sure we don't stick anything to the bottom of the pan. I'm going to season with just the salt. We've used the, the other pepper. We've got one more salt and pepper left, but I would save them for tomorrow, for day two. Okay, now this couscous with chicken, you're meant to just heat it in the can directly over one of those little solid fuel heaters. I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to mix it in with this. And again, we might thicken it with one of those crackers if we feel it needs that. So just to have a look and see what, we're, what we've got here. Oh, it's a nice sort of red pepper style sauce. I'm going to taste a little bit of that cold. It's a canned product, so obviously it's perfectly safe to eat cold. It might just not be so good, but I'm going to taste a little bit anyway. Yeah, the couscous is actually quite hard. It would need to be warmed up to soften up. That tastes really good though. Mm. Lots of nice chicken in there. And lots of red pepper flavour. Okay, that's doing okay now. So we're just going to carefully break this up into the mixture we've already made. Try not to waste any. Now there's a lot of flavour in here, so if we, if we wanted to make this go further, or if we were in fact catering for two people out of this ration pack, I could have gone and picked a lot more chestnuts, and I think it probably would have easily stood to be further diluted and stretched out with those other ingredients. But this will do for now. This is just to feed me, obviously, so let's get that simmering. So I think we are going to thicken this again with some of these crackers. So we've got chocolate crackers and then we've got the whole grain crackers. Now I think these whole grain crackers are sweet, but I'm going to give it a try anyway. Let's have a taste of one of these just on their own. Yeah, they're a little bit sweet, these whole grain crackers. They're, they're like a graham cracker, but harder. Um, but we can get away with we can get away with that in this dish. It's got some salt in there. It's got some other flavours. So we're just going to snap up those crackers and drop them in and let them soften up because they're actually quite hard crackers in, in any case. And although they're okay to chew on, they are a bit tough. Oh, there's a little sausage in there as well. How about that? <laughs> oh, two sausages. Well, how delightful. That's pretty good. I'm just going to let that just bubble away gently for a while, just to reduce down and to dissolve those crackers and make them into like a thickening. And I think we will have the cheese. So we've got some spread cheese here. I think we'll have this on a cracker while we're waiting for this to cook. So, you know, I could have saved this for breakfast, but there we go. So it's like a, well, like a white spread cheese in a can. Let's have a little taste of it on its own. Hmm. So it's like, it's quite salty, creamy, Nice sort of uh, cream cheese flavour. Doesn't taste too processed actually. So we're going to have some of that 
on one of these plain crackers. Mm, that's really good. Good stuff, and there's plenty of it. Okay. Hmm. I have an idea here. Well, rather than use another pair of cracker, another set of crackers, I'm going to put the rest of this cream cheese in this dish, just to swirl it round and finish it. I'm going to take that off the heat now. And then we've got a sort of creamy finish to that dish. That actually looks pretty good. I'm just going to have a little taste of everything together. See where we got to. Mm, that tastes really, really superb. And I appreciate I've mixed everything up here. And so I'm not able to really t give you an impression of what that chicken and couscous tastes like on its own, except I did try it cold, obviously. But um, yeah, that's really delicious. And it's turned it into a much larger and more hearty meal than it was straight out of the box. And those wholemeal crackers have just stayed together. It's made it feel like a much more hearty and substantial dish than it was at the beginning. It's really good. Really, really tasty. Mm. Let's see if I can find a piece of chestnut. There, there's a bit. Mm. And so the chestnuts in here are just like little pieces of potato. It's great. Let's try one of these sausages. Mm. So these must be beef. They're like little salami type sausages, but really nice and moist. Well, I'm just going to finish off my meal now. You don't want to sit and watch me eat. And then we're going to head for home because it is starting to get a little bit dark now. Um, so we'll head for home and then we'll just review in the studio what we've got left out of this pack and what we could potentially do with it. I don't know if I'm going to get around to doing that, but I will taste some of the ingredients, at least on camera, at least the other main. So that's it for now. We'll probably reconvene back in the studio on it, unless anything interesting happens on the way back to the car. Now, despite being October, there are still a few blackberries around. And so I probably wouldn't eat that fresh, but the red ones we could pick and boil up for our beverage. And if there's any sound black ones still, I could, you know, sound ripe ones, we could put them in as well. There's vitamin C in there, and yeah, that would that'd be okay for our beverage. So that would keep us going on drinks. Okay, so at the end of the day, let's have a look at what we've got left out of here, and let's talk a little bit about what we did today. So we've got the tin of tuna still. We've got most of those little fire lighters. We've got the fruit jelly bar the Isostar cereal bar, one little square of dark chocolate, the cocoa drink, the energy drink, I don't know what we're going to do with that because it really isn't, it isn't great, the plum jam, five packets of biscuits, of which we've got three of the chocolate ones, one of plain, and one of cereals. And the salmon, rice, and vegetables. And the tissues, salt and pepper, one packet of sugar, green tea with mint, and the water purification tablets. And 
stupid little spork. So if we were going to go for a second day, if we were going to try and spin this out for a second day, what would we do? Well, the first thing I would do, obviously, is head back to those chestnut trees and pick up some more of these chestnuts. If we work that area, we could get half a basket of chestnuts in a very short space of time. And these are really super nutrition. These are as good as potatoes. Probably pick a few more of these apples, even though they were quite bitter. I think if they were stewed down with some sugar, they'd be just fine. So, if we were gonna organize th another three meals out of this for the next day. So the first thing to say is that making those things into soups like we did and putting some of the crackers in turns a can of food into a whole meal. And also putting it in a soup like that makes all of those nutrients that much more available to your body. So it's a good thing to do that in terms of getting maximum nutrition out of this set. So anyway, if we were gonna do that again tomorrow, here's what we'd do. So breakfast, just to get us started, I would probably just do plum jam on one of those packets of chocolate biscuits. I'd then make up probably a little porridge, I think, out of the Isostar cereal bar, the cocoa, and the remaining two packets of chocolate biscuits, and make that into a little sort of porridge type of food thing, probably for about 11s is, I think. And maybe I'd break up that chocolate and put little chunks of that in there as well. For lunch, we'd probably just have the tuna with the remaining plain crackers and green tea. And then in the evening, we try and make something with the salmon, rice and vegetables. We've got some salt and pepper there. And I would probably try to pick some more chestnuts and have, have that with those. And maybe we would have some of these apples with the tuna at lunchtime because fruit and fish is just fine. You know, especially if it's a sour one like this. These are sour like lemons, so fish and lemon. You can see how that would work. And then we've got the little fruit bar there that we can use to fill in a gap somewhere. We've got the cereal crackers as well we could maybe put them into the salmon rice and vegetables to bulk that out as well so there's definitely enough food there if we did a bit more foraging for another day's food beverages are a bit more of a challenge there was a I would have said this thing was a bit short of beverages anyway it could have done with another sachet of coffee probably another little tea bag in there as well now on the second day hot beverages are going to become more important than they were on the first day because We've got to boil that water. If we're getting water out of that river, we've got to boil it. Uh, we could use the water purification tablets, but I would prefer to boil that water if I'm going to drink it. And putting things into hot water to make a beverage makes it more palatable to drink. So we could have um, tea made from those bilberry leaves. We could have uh, an infusion of these crab apples, maybe with some other berries as well, like the blackberries and those white... Uh, white bean berries. So yeah, there's plenty of options there for making infusions and tea-like drinks on the second day. So anyway, so that's the end of the first day of field testing this ration pack. I'm probably not going to do another whole day out, but I will at some point do a video where I open these two tins here so we can see what's inside them. The rest of it, we really know what they all are. And so I don't need to do that. If you want to see some of these other things like the little fruit bar or the cereal bar, just have a look at the video I did, which I'll link down below for menu number nine, because these are the same as they were in menu number nine. These are the things that are really different. So we'll do a little follow up video where we taste these separately on their own, hopefully fairly soon. Just to say also, I'm unboxing and testing this ration pack menu number two in collaboration with Alana from AK Fabe. There are links down below and in this card right now to Alana's content. I recommend that you go and have a look at that because although Alana's doing the same menu as me, the contents were actually quite a bit different. So there's some different stuff to see on her video. So be sure to check that out. So for now, that's all. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.